Hello, everyone, and welcome to a riveting next edition. Oh, my God, stand me, too. <sighs> of This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 302. Two. And with me is, actually, I'm outnumbered and outgunned. I am, I'm done. I'm just going to be the eye candy in the corner at this point. Um, with me is Mr. Adele Gutman with AdeleGutman.com. Also with me is Miss Tammy Carlisle with the world-renowned Milestone Internet. And she's also world renowned. So it's kind of like a dual re- world renowned y thing. It's yeah, it's all good stuff. Anyway, hi guys. How are you this morning? Oh, 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 Dean. Okay. The balance of the universe has come back into play. We have we have <laughs> Dean Schmidt with me. Come on, Dean. We must represent. Right. <laughs> um well, I, I know that Adele is dealing with the fact of that the squirrels are currently attacking the house and the dogs are saving her from the tragedy that would be if the squirrels actually you know, succeeded uh, in attacking the house. Good dog. Um, <laughs> hey, okay. So uh, I got like a whole bag full of stuff to talk about. But to be mindful of everyone that I have the privilege of your your time today, uh, is there a particular topic that any of you would like to kick off with that you would find near and dear to your hearts to discuss today? I have I have two zeroos if you know what I'm talking about. There she is, Melissa. Do you mind my saying that I have two zeroos today? You two zeroos. Zeroo. <laughs> <laughs> <Love it. laughs> we're stealing. We're plagiarizing the hell out of your podcast. Okay, love we're it. Just taking from the award-winning podcast, multi-award-winning podcast, and just ripping out the good stuff and saying, "No, no, we've been saying that for Go for it. ever." <laughs> You can only do it if you actually do the jingle that goes along with it. Oh, right? yeah. News or booze? For marketing uh, news, you cannot lose. News yeah, or we, we, we try to steal it, but it just boils down to a jibby jibby of things. But yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Um, actually, now I'm okay. starting to get the theme song from Blues Clues in my head. It's just going down <laughs> the wrong way. <laughs> all righty. We've already gone south, and it's all been a 30 seconds in the show. <laughs> well, you know, uh, this morning uh, on CNBC, I saw that a new airline is coming here right to Charleston. Uh I'm really excited about it called Breeze and it's going to start flights next week, but it's already available online and you can book one way flights uh, for starting at $39. It's meant to serve underserved areas. It's here in Charleston, which is, in my opinion, a bit underserved. And uh, I'm going to be able to go for $39 or $49 to straight to Connecticut direct, which is just a wonderful thing. And there had, I think they said maybe they had something like 39 different flights, really affordable, and you can cancel up to 15 minutes before the flight with no penalty. Wow. 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 Are they flying anywhere west? Yeah, where are they going? That's the big no. question. Uh, not all the way west. I think that they're mostly in the eastern region, but but yes, de- definitely a bit west. And I think they might be in Texas. Um, I have to ch- check on that. But I know they have a direct flight to Tampa, for example. There are definitely a lot of attractive flights and definitely a good price. And if they're just can be pet friendly, then it's going to be a winner. Adele, uh, I really just have to ask you a question. Me. If you cancel within 15 minutes of your flight, who's going to turn the propeller over to get the engine started if you don't show up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, yes, don't let it be another Spirit Airlines. We do not need another. Oh, one. please. Yeah. <laughs> Stand up room only. I see, you know, I honestly physically, I mean, even though I've shed some poundage and stuff, even my just my height, I can't fly Spirit. I literally. The, la- the last time I had to fly Spirit, I-, I literally was on my knees on the floor to fold my leg under the chair because that was the only way I could fit in the chair based on the narrowness between the rows of chairs. It was, it was yeah, people were looking at me like, you don't look very comfortable, do you? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It just it really speaks to uh, this ongoing conversation that we have about uh People cutting back and trying to be more economical and more economical, but economic cost control. I heard somebody say this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I wish I could remember who I'm stealing this line from. 
but you can't grow your revenue uh, on cost control in the long oh. run. You have to do on building building customers and building products and experiences that people love. And we have just, I mean, I'm not the biggest person in the world. And I remember so often being so scrunched in, I could not move. And that might be okay for a 45 minute flight, but not for a long-term flight. I, I, if, you, if you see me smiling larger than normal, it's because two things are working great today. One is I have the detriment of having to be very granular about my tracking what we say because we are now on the one and only, first and only hospitality TV channel. So we are broadcasting on hospitalitychannel.tv, which Actually, is now also getting, huh? Get that on Roku? Roku, Apple, and Google, and Amazon. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Yep. Uh, that's on the, now there's a, on those ones. Okay. Broadcast for free, but it also broadcasts on that. And that's a subscription channel. Cause it's the only way you can get on those platforms is you have to do a monetization <clears> for the platform. You can't offer a free channel unless, well, unless you're Netflix and even then it's not a free channel. So, um, but yes, we're doing it. And I just, why I'm smiling is because the, uh, MUP eight software necessary to do it does work with my current, uh, you know, band-aids and bubble gum configuration I have for the live show broadcast. So I'm actually able to simulcast on it. So what we have done, what I've done is taken all of our old shows this past year and have put into uh, linear TV. Like if I want to put a commercial in here, <clears throat> my, uh, milestone, you know, for free, I'll just put it in. I don't care. Um, and, uh, you know, fuel like, hey, by the way, brought to you by fuel. You know, um, <laughs> but uh, can, and Adele, please, you do a little 30 second. I'll drop it in. Thank you. Um, my little world, you can save I it. to help me develop. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and so uh, I have them all dropping in so that I can put stuff into it. I can do a linear. I also have it on demand, which is what you get on Roku and all the rest of it. It's an on-demand poll. You pay, and then you pull what shows you want. But right now, the linear version of it uh, is just like a regular TV station. I have to plan out seven days worth of programming, put in all the stuff. So right now, it's just running this year's live shows and podcasts, uh, mm -hmm. the video podcasts. And so I will be, if you want to, Melissa, I will be more than happy. If you guys have put video content, you know, the videography, um, of your podcast, you know, where you do the the background with the little audio and make it a video. I'll put it in there if you want it in there. Adele, we got to do that for you. We got to get a, hooked you. up to a platform called Headliner so that we can do those yep. in. Dean, same I thing. You know, and we just start expanding the program. But literally, I look, there is nobody else that has a hospitality TV channel. Well <laughs> done. Congratulations, Lord. So we are in hospitality TV land. Yeah. Now you can watch this 24-7. <laughs> yeah, if y'all hey, if, you know, if any insomnia, anybody has insomnia, <laughs> by all means. I added up the amount of time just in the live show that we've been doing for all these years, and a month and a half, nonstop, 24-7, you can hear us talk. Yeah. <laughs> wow. With no repeats. Yeah. With yeah. no repeats. <laughs> right? Now you have to figure out how to get the clubhouse conversations in a video format. Okay, you you, it's replay. funny you bring that up. I asked the clubhouse uh, these past two sessions this week. I said, hey, guys. How do you feel about me recording this? We, we have some gems of conversation. We have some great things that come from it that are just like, poof, you weren't there, you missed it. Um, I got a mixed bag and I'm going to keep asking because there's a couple of things. And, and Ed brought this up when he was talking. And I, I do believe that this is a part of the part. Uh, some people are a little bit more candid, a little bit more open because they know who's in the room when they're talking to know th th that maybe they, they, in confidence, they're just a little bit more free with their perspectives than if they thought it was being recorded and then able to be shared beyond that. So uh, in his morning edition, I see that because he brings in some pretty heavy hitters into his room and you know they may loosen up in some of their dialogue, talking to peers is the way they feel it because the room, you know, whatever the size is. I, thought, I don't know about my afternoon one. Afternoon, I get everybody from around the world. I mean, I'm getting people all over the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I'm, I'm thinking it's not a big deal for them if they, because you know, I have to announce it. I have to say, hey, we're recording this. Um, and if but they're not happy also, with it, like so, every time somebody comes up on stage, you have to stop and ask them for permission to record. Them. Yes, yep. I have to make sure that everyone that contributes understands that this is a recorded session. Uh, you know, and of course, I'm not charging for the content, so I'm not trying to monetize it. You know, in the sense that it would go on the TV channel that's for free. That hey, guys, you know, this is our great sessions we had this week in Clubhouse. Um, it's kind of a great leaping stone because I'm off, you know, the, the club that I'm offering that's a pay for service is an intermediary between the two where people get this conversation on Clubhouse. But then if they really need expert opinion, but they don't need to hire a third party under contract, but they just need 
expert advice, expert insight, expert solutions. You know, there's this clubhouse I'm offering per month subscription. You, you can do it for a month, you can do it for six months, whatever, as long as you need that access. And so it's like a halfway point. Um, so it's all kind of piecing a puzzle together for everybody. But yeah, I'd love to record the clubhouse stuff. But you know, I've been on a couple of, of ones that were recorded and the way I knew it was recorded is it's in the title. It's the right. title and then it says recorded. And I did not hear anybody asking or talking about it being recorded or asking for permission mm. during the thing. It just said it on the top and that's how you knew. And it might be that's enough for that. Um, I, 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 but they did recommend to your point, Melissa, that they say that if any time you bring people up, you should remind them that they are in a recorded environment and that, you know, what they say will be shared in future tense. Possibly. Yeah. I mean, I know but, when we first got started and we did our first Clubhouse on Clubhouse podcast, <laughs> Um, Stuart was very clear that at that point, and maybe things have changed I and mean, it's been over a month now, so maybe things have loosened up a little bit, but he specifically said like, we have to get consent from every person who speaks. They, they were very tight about it at the beginning. They used to have in their policy writings specifically that these are not recorded sessions and that mm -hmm. you cannot, it would be in violation of privacy law that if you were to record it. They have changed their policy. I mean, if you look at the new, you know, related updates, see what's going on, you read the policy. They did modify that it can be recorded with proper permission is the way they refer to it. Yeah. And I think, too, it's it's different when it's, Melissa, like you guys pulling people or like the ones that Lauren does where, you know, he just randomly says, oh, Tammy's in the room. Let me pull her up on stage. <laughs> well, no, I've never done that to you, Tammy, all the time. <laughs> Versus... Like if the five of us got on in a clubhouse room, we we know it's being recorded. You're not pulling additional people up on right. stage and maybe they aren't as overt about, hey, this is being recorded. Hey, this is being recorded. Yeah. But you, I think you're spot on. I mean, I, and yes, I, I, you know, I have mixed feelings. I mean, you're right. I think you get some more candid responses when people feel like it's it's here and it's gone. Mm -hmm. But I also know, like, especially with, like with Ed's session, that's 5 a.m. my time. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I like Ed. I don't think I have enough to get up at 5 a.m. Come on, you are a conversational at wizard at 5 a.m. Without coffee, I might add. No, I was going to say, Diet, diet Coke, yeah. <laughs> That's you. I try um, to catch at least part of that room every day, and there are some really amazing conversations that go yeah. on in that room. I know. I would love and, it if they could read you. Yeah. Yeah, I tried I, I, speaking on that show a couple of times, but I'm on my walk, so I'm having head puffing <laughs> while I try to talk, and the wind is in the microphone, and it just doesn't work. I tell you what, that, that is one of the endearing aspects of Cloud. You, some people look at it as, I look at it as endearing. Sometimes you hear that beep, beep in the, back, in the background because they're backing up their car and or mm -hmm. they're getting in and out of their car or the, no, no, no cream on that. You know you're in the coffee line. <laughs> I've been hearing a lot of birds and geese recently. And that's that's me. Wildlife, <laughs> there's wildlife in those calls. Yeah, uh, but 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 it is it is a neat form that has really and it could have gone when you think about it, it could have gone so many ways. It could have been into this uh, pickup area chat room thing. It could have gone that way because it really was just an open platform of hey, you can have an audio discussion. And it could have gone you know what are you doing, little girl? You know, kind of convoy way, and then. It, instead, it went to the LinkedIn way. It was like, hey, this yeah. is a great business interaction capability. We get to dialogue with peers. And I mean, granted, you see, there's a lot of variations to rooms, and it doesn't come into my feed as much because I've really tailored who I follow, rooms I'm a part of. So I'm probably not seeing all the stuff I'm condemning. But uh, I like the fact that the part that I do enjoy is there, that there are some yeah. really good conversations out there. I have always been yeah. curious. Oh, sorry. I, I haven't looked for the junk, right? The, the crappy stuff like you alluded to. So I haven't looked for it, but I have been curious if I did, is it out there? And there is that type of crap on, on Club? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of how to get rich in, you know, scheme rooms. Yeah. Oh, there's a, yeah, I'm a billionaire. Meanwhile, I go in my little Pinto car and drive away later. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you go to make a million dollars. But meanwhile, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I keep getting information on cryptocurrency, but Clubhouse thinks that apparently I need to invest in crypto. <laughs> I talked to a guy, um, and this is a strange string of conversations. So, I, I, you know, I'm a VR geek. I have the VR headsets and so forth. And I, I love all the stuff I use it for, but there's also some games I play with, which is a lot of fun. And those games are interactive where you're playing with teams of other people that you don't, you know, that you randomly get to gather with and play this game with. 
And there's this one guy that I play with semi regularly. We pop when we see each other, we'll play together. Um, and he's a cryptocurrency, just that's his thing. And he's talking back and forth. He was up 60, down 20, up 10, down 50. Um, and I'm like, what in coins? No dollars. I'm like, dude, seriously? You know, you're fluctuating by a hundred thousand dollar kind of stuff. What the heck? It, I, I, I get nervous. I'm spending twenty dollars more on a something or other. You know, right. like, uh, the hundred thousand dollar variant. And and I said, so you doing pretty well here? I says, nope, I'm in debt. And I'm like, well, that's not really a good combo if you think about it. You know, you're betting on risky uh, <laughs> investments and you're already in debt. Mm. <laughs> But anywho, yeah. oh, did you all see the wonderful little cute video I shared from Apple? Or did you see Apple's video? <laughs> it was incredible. It was really incredible. And it changed my perspective on giving permission. There's no question about it. It was so good. Show it to everyone. That that, that was- They did, they did a good job of presenting their case. Um, you know, from my marketing perspective, I'm going, going oh yeah, yeah, I kind of do that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely do that, you know? <laughs> But for me personally, I'm of, I think probably just a p perspective of life right now is like, hey, if you're learning it from me, great. Here, matter of fact, I'll share it with here. Take it. You know, <laughs> I, I'm not thinking I'm doing anything that would be, I'm not so worried about it in that sense. But I do worry about the security issues of it. Of I don't want them to be able to, I mean, I, I use password software programs that are constantly reminding me that I reuse too many passwords, Mind even you. though I have them behind a wall. Yep. Because so I'm lazy. If I say no to that, that with that Apple commercial you were talking about, I say, no, I don't want to share this data. Do I then sack? No, not do I. I know I do. Am I willing to then sacrifice the customization and personalization that that mm -hmm. would have brought me otherwise? Yes. Where, where the, That's what's where, not explained in that little pop up. And I think people might feel yeah. differently if it was explained in that way. Like you're going to get ads no matter what happens. Would you rather have more relevant ads or complete garbage ads? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's yeah. the item that I was more concerned about wasn't in that ad actually, but Apple is also now launching these things that they call air tags and they're little buttons that you can put like on your wallet or on your key, mm -hmm. those kind of things that in and of itself is not so not even new, really actually a little Bluetooth alert that will you know tell you where your wallet is or your keys, where it's not a bit new, but they have an extension of that. Uh, where if let's say that I went on vacation and I was at uh, a beach in California and oops, I left my wallet somewhere. I can't find it. And I got back home and realized it. Now I can actually put that out to the network of iPhones walking around in New York City or in California, or whatever. And the network now will detect where my air tag was at. That's a little creepy. <laughs> and they tell you that there's all kinds of privacy on it. Of course, they tell you all that kind of stuff. I don't know how I feel about that, though. You know what, though? If you serve me an ad that speaks to me like uh, I, 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 I like Latin dancing and Zumba and everything, and I got served a, a video for Fuego dance shoes. Now, most people will not spend $100 on dance sneakers, but... I will, and that's that's wonderful that they hit the target audience, and I was so happy to take it, so happy. Yeah, I think there's two things. I think, um, Dean, to your privacy point of view, I mean, the, the whole find my phone, right, has used that same technology for years. So you're right, there there are some potential creepy elements, but I, I mean, yeah, I personally, I guess, kind of feel like I'm, I'm a bit okay with it because it's Apple, and I, I've used a tile for years. I lose, I, I'm constantly using my watch to find my phone. Oh, it went in the last night. It <laughs> fell on the side of the couch yeah. cushion, right? So I'm okay with that. Um, to the ad point of view, I don't know. As a consumer, I almost like getting non-relevant ads because they're easier to click off and not buy, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. I mean, yes, I would love, I like seeing relevant ads. Um, there are certain apps that I have no qualms going, yeah, let Apple have my info, let Apple customize, you know, send my data and analytics so they can better. And there are others where I'm like, mm, no. No, and I think it just depends on the usefulness of the app, what a, and and your trust in the company and what they're doing with your data. Yeah. You know what I don't like is after I bought it, stop sending me the ads. <laughs> oh. 
you know, it's so funny. Uh, it, 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 you often look at advertisers and some people are like, you're new to this, aren't you? Because uh, you go to a website that you actually have an account on. You're just going to the site to log in. And then your Facebook feed is inundated with the yeah. fact that you visited. The and it's like, would somebody please in the back of the house realize and make a distinction between those that are unsubscribed or unregistered users to your website to be nulled yeah. out of your retargeting campaigns rather than the, I know I use your platform. I just was there using it. Why are you sending me all these freaking ads? And then to their demise, I actually chuckle because I got a cheaper price for my account on one of them because they <laughs> offered me a better <laughs> rate. I'm like, you know, I think I'll take advantage of that little offer. Thank you. Click. And they just cost themselves money because I down priced my, my account with them because they were offering some incentive. But and I, I know what the problem is. I have three email addresses. And not to mention, I also have access to my parents' email addresses. So sometimes I get targeted something that um, a, a, an 86-year-old uh, <laughs> person would, would want to get maybe. But they don't know that Adele's Hotels and and AdeleGutman.com are not, they don't know that they're the same thing. No, no. No, they don't. You know, it's funny you say that. Uh, uh, Renee, my wife, she has an accounting uh, company uh, or you know, bookkeeping company, I should say. And she often at times has to research the invoices she gets from her clients. She had to set up a whole different email for it because as she researched it, of course, then all of the targeting ads associated with her research to those websites would come flooding through for based on what she was connecting for. So we had to set up extra accounts so that she wasn't getting stuff that really wasn't related because of literally poor retargeting. Just it, it kind of lends itself that good retargeting has a frequency control, it has a message control, and it has a purpose control, and not a just on switch. You yeah. know, that's like, oh, you touched? Oh, we're going to bang the bejeebers out of this until you're so tired of us, you never want to come back. And that's how I feel about some of this retargeting stuff. It's like, dude, seriously, I've got the, you know, you've sent this thing to me persistently for a week now. It's everywhere I go. This is a waste of your money. And yet somebody's cashing and going, hey, I showed you 15 million per impressions. Oh, good. Well, and, and like you said, though, once they've bought the product or in, in hotel terms, I booked the room, right? So now I've booked the room. You've got to kill that cookie. You're mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, ooh, ooh, back to my broadcasting thing. I'm going to take my new shiny toy. Okay. So <laughs> this broadcasting thing does three different patterns. So if you think about this, you have on demand, which is what we're kind of used to with Netflix. Like, oh, there's show number 12. I want to watch show number 12. Okay. That's on demand. Okay, that's pretty much standard. And that's what I have on the, the four pay services right now. Um, but I also have this in this free service. Then there is what's called a uh, loop, which we're familiar with at hotels where you come in, you turn on the local TV channel and it's a loop program. Once the contest finishes rolling, it just restarts again and rolls. So that's a loop program. Then there's linear, which I just talked about earlier, which is I have to program out what shows when as we go forward. Um, so this platform does all three. So I really got it because I, from a hotel user's perspective, it used to be wicked expensive to have an internal channel to your hotel because it was reliant upon the, uh, the hardware provider for your TV services. Well, we've been booting up these TV services for a long time. A lot of the hotels now are just doing local service on commercial scale. Like I have 40 rooms or 100 rooms and I'm buying it from the local cable company, the local uh, TV provider, and it's smart TVs in the rooms. Well, the cool part about this platform is it's a smart TV program. It's an actually a program that you go on your smart TV. So you could have it where somebody shows up in your hotel and there's a looped channel, which is, hi, welcome to wherever. And then you have all your content about where you're at. And then there could be another channel, which is a linear channel, which is at 11 o'clock, our local, our, our chef of the restaurant is going to show you today's specials. And it could be a live push or a recorded push that you already had for what you're doing in lunch at the restaurant today. And if two o'clock, it's the spa. And at five o'clock, it's the dinner or whatever. So you have a linear program to it. And then you have an on-demand, which is, oh, there's a story about Korean restaurants in the area because you're next to Koreatown or something. Or you're next to, you know, the, the greatest big ball of twine. And you have an on-demand one that you can pull ones from. And the cool part is you can have all three on this thing. And the cost of it is nothing, really. It's the, it's the production you, you need to create it is really the effort that's needed for it. So... I'll just tell totally you so. You know what? It sounds so wonderful, but I, I feel like a lot of hoteliers say, I, "What I really need is for it to be easy." You, you know, we we are a group of people who are based in hospitality, and 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 some of this is just too complicated. Just oh too yeah, many I mean, things I, to deal with. I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
channel Stuart when I say this. First, you have to do the block and tackle to make sure that all your things work correctly. Then you get to play with toys. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, Mill. I think you're very, very right. That, 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 that this is something that you you can't do it if you don't have already the content. But the other really neat, cool part about this platform, which I really enjoyed, was you can take YouTube links and put them in as your content. So rather than chasing down your CVB or TDC saying, hey, can I get the footage to load up onto my server to put into this program? It's like, just take their YouTube link with permission and put it into your program, okay? And schedule for when you're gonna use it. So you can take existing content. So it alleviates some of the pressure to what you're talking about, Adele, where it's like, look, this sounds like really brilliant, but I don't have videos. I certainly don't have more than a couple of minute ads at best. I don't have content, what do I do? You can pull a lot of great content from your market with permission into your channel and just say, hey, look, you know, uh, this is, we're going to feature what you did on this restaurant. We're going to feature what you did uh, on, you know, Discover XYZ City or something like that. So it doesn't fit for everybody, I know, but it, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm just really it, happy with it. It, so, it sounds awesome. If they just make it easy, you know, some some content management systems, for example, for hotels are so simple. It you, you the minute you think of something, you can just put it in and it's done, and it's so intuitive. And other ones are are so laborious; they must be designed that you have to hire somebody else to do it for you. Uh, I, I think everybody in the hospitality business is looking for a little more simplicity I, in everything, in all the tools, and we should be able to give it. I mean, we're living in the future. <laughs> I'm ready. I, I, this is this is the bane of this now is that I have to uh, break down the timestamps correctly in our conversation where before I could be general, like, you know, within a couple of minutes of when we talked about something. Now I have to be specific because when I do this on another platform, it breaks down in the uh, subtexting exactly mm -hmm. anchor points that I can pick and say, pick this anchor, pick this anchor. When we talked about this, when we talked about this. So if somebody was watching the video, they could just drop to that one. Now, YouTube already does it when you load up a video and you put uh, the time sequence in. But again, being general was easy then. Now it's specific where I can quote exactly what we're talking about at that time. And then they click on the button and it goes right to that time marker and plays the video from that point forward. So now I have to get better at my note taking, basically. Oh, no. Oh, that That's <laughs> homework. <laughs> oh my that's, goodness. That's too laborious. Let's yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm with you. I, it's, it's, I, it's, it, you know, I was doing so it already. Right. I, I was doing it already. You just didn't notice it where I would do things like, I think around the 25 minute mark, we talked about this and the 47 minute, we talked about this. I already did it. If you looked at any of the YouTube replays, when I reproduce it, the timestamps were in it. Um, but it was general. With this one, it needs to be a little bit more exact. One of the requirements of this platform feeding up to these paid for platforms is if somebody's gonna pay a fee to watch these things, it has to be worthy of them paying and it has to be accurate to what they're paying for. So. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's just one of those things. Okay, so okay. You need an app for that. Uh, yeah, it's it's. <laughs> it, I think I'm turning into hospitality broadcasting. I'm going to dump my clients right. and just get into broadcasting. Yeah. I added already up. I'm averaging ten hours a week in broadcasting time between podcasts and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's and you know, I'm like, dang, I'm broadcasting fool. Um, and does that include Clubhouse? That's including Clubhouse. Yeah. Because that's. I mean. What that's well, I guess four plus this of six yeah, hours. It, it, just they they average at least an hour and a yeah. little bleed over plus this plus the podcast, and that's not including production time because I have to post edit and and I take this recording and then I put in an intro, lower bar thirds, closing, and then I repush it up and then distribution, multi channel, and, and then I try to help Adele with her podcast, uh, Dean's podcast, uh, Holly's podcast, um, Lily's podcast. And that's not including those times. That's just that's just actually being on talking is about 10 hours last week. I actually started tracking it because I know it's on minimum wow. seven hours, just in general time yeah. consumption. But last week was 10 hours because we ran yeah. over a few clubhouse and stuff. I would definitely make more time for Clubhouse if there were more recorded sessions because then I would feel like the reach afterwards would be more valuable. I, I I will take that because I am going to continue to ask because I don't want to irritate people and make them not come because they think they're going to be recorded. But by the same token, there's a huge value to some of these conversations that you all have participated in. I mean, they've all been great conversations where it's like, shoot, if I put that in a bottle, I mean, we could put that out and say that was a great solution or that was a great idea. You know. Well, I I uh, 
partnered with someone on making a, a, a clubhouse session one time and at the end of it she said I really love it but I felt like we were talking to other hospitality experts not the hoteliers themselves in that session but you could feel at least if later on somebody who wanted to listen to that conversation uh, were coming to it it would be worth it would be worth doing it you know how it is it, mm -hmm. it does attract a lot of fellow consultants do, yeah. Melissa I mean Tammy I should say do, do you do you guys see Clubhouse fitting into your market strategy of exposure or something, or is it just more of a personal interest category for most people right now? Are you, um, if you're talking about like from milestone standpoint, I mean, yeah, yeah I'm trying to get more involved. Just from exp from exp I think there's some. Um, I I definitely made some connections based on conversations on Clubhouse, but not like, oh, I you know I. It was $5 million in, you know, hotel sales or anything like that. Right. So, but it's definitely something, um, I mean, talking about, and then also like, how do, how do we leverage content? So one of the things I've been trying to think of, and again, I, I haven't been as consistent in clubhouse, you know, like, like you lawyer there every day, but Adele, like maybe an idea, like you partnered with that person, you had this great conversation. I don't know if there is, you know, even if it's a, like you, you to record it, cause you know, to have, maybe not to share, but then can you distill that information into an article or a, mm. a post on LinkedIn, right? A, a, an article on LinkedIn about, hey, we recently did this, this clubhouse topic on, you know, it, I'll speak to you, Adele, reputation yeah. management. And here were five ideas that came out of that session. Good so point. I've been trying to play with how to do stuff, you know, stuff like that. But again, I haven't been as consistent uh, as I would like to be in joining the conversations or having them. But I think that's one way to, you know, how, how do we uh, take that information and distill it out there? Because I know there's that whole, you know, fear of missing out, right? And like I said, <clears throat> I would love to join Ed's Clubhouse, like just to listen because he has had some heavy hitters. I just know me, 5 a.m. because that means I have to be up before 5 a.m. is just a stretch. I'm not there. If it was an hour later, from and I get why it's not like I'm not mm. asking him to move it for me like hello um, I'm not that <laughs> egocentric but oh, yeah I, it, you know Edward. but I Ed would love, be like hey move the show well, for me. <laughs> well of course Ed would. I am not Ed <laughs> um, but you know but if there was some kind of a, a occasional mm. recap especially when there was a really like, Lauren you did the one. I think it was a week ago, and my weeks are melding uh, on video tools and video things mm -hmm. like taking that and packaging something that that's like a LinkedIn post or article or somewhere. I, I think there's some some value to that and might actually open up people to then want to come in. Oh, wow, this is great content. Yeah, mm -hmm. I need to get on Clubhouse more often. Well, that's uh, really but I, it would be useful, too, yeah. because you can say, here's what we talked about. Here's the recording and you can post that somewhere. Yep. You know what? It's a great opportunity for a journalist to get in on some of these clubhouse things and just report about it, maybe without mentioning the audience's names or, or right. something. Maybe there's some discretion that's required there. But uh, HSMAI, uh, after all, they have those roundtable discussions. And when they share, they say maybe who was at the meeting, but they don't say who said what. Mm -hmm. Right in the actual article, because yeah. that's meant to be a little more discreet. But no, Tammy, you have a brilliant idea in that sense, because I think I could pass that off initially for people to realize that I say, I can tell them it's like, look, this isn't going to get rebroadcasted. We're recording this for the ability to make sure we don't miss any great points that can be shared in written format and see if that flies easier for some people on the, you know, we don't want to miss the great dialogue because we know uh, that a lot of people really look back on the conversation that day and go, wow, there was some really good stuff. And and they may not remember the nuances of it. Because I get a lot of LinkedIn comments afterwards of, hey, Lauren, you mentioned this, or Lauren, you had talked about this. And it's scary about what the people that you don't really think are paying attention are, because I made a comment once, actually, no, Steph, the girl that came in, Stephanie Mayo, who joins me a lot, she always says, hey, Lauren, you, you always post a link, uh, the link for that on your LinkedIn 
Uh, so if anybody needs to go over and join the next one because we're having problems with people knowing that the show is running, they're just doing your LinkedIn. I had like 40 people trying to get on LinkedIn with me. And I'm like, who the hell are these people? You know, because it's just, because <laughs> I'm, I'm a little yeah. restricted as to who I join on LinkedIn compared to, you know, Facebook where it's like, oh, you're breathing. Sure. Hell, you know, it's like <laughs> Different, different platform. Uh, <laughs> there's a term for that, but I won't use it now. Uh, <laughs> but the 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 usage of it is pretty cool. The other is is that I think from a notes perspective, if I start posting what was the result of the conversation, so people would at least know that there was some context to it. Because these are all for me blurring together. I, I've started been doing this since February, mid February when I joined in, and I've not missed a day Monday through Thursday for the whole time. So if you just start adding up the numbers, you know, this is 70 or 80 that we've done so far, uh, you know, of these things. And they're an hour long and you don't know which way you, know, you open the door saying, hi, welcome. We're doing this. And then you don't know where it's going to go. You have an idea. Kind of like the show here. You know, it's like, hey, I got an idea of something we want to talk about. But then where does it go? I don't know. We'll go down the rabbit hole, um, which makes that kind of show easy to do. But, yeah, there's some, been some really good content or conversations. And recently, it's been about restaurants. I got to be honest with you. Most of our conversations have been really focused on restaurants these days, mainly because of Chris coming in and, and stuff like that. But uh, it's interesting the lack of discussion we have about a very strong component of our industry that really is the integral part of most of our hotel operations anyway. We're just we're not really addressing some of their issues as well. So it's been kind of a fun dialogue to bring that into a regularity sound thing. That's that's interesting that you talk about that too. Um, so I'm on the committee for the marketing strategy conference for HSMAI, and we're working on putting together content. And one of the the sessions we're um, trying to package around is ancillary revenue, right? So from um, and because the strategy conference and Rock, which for those of you that don't know, is the revenue optimization conference, are back to back this year. It looks like there's going to be a uh, ancillary uh, ancillary revenue from the marketing side and then a subsequent ancillary revenue from the revenue management side the next day but thinking through fmb golf spa like all of the things that for a lot of hotels that can add up to a significant chunk of revenue and what are you doing in that from that standpoint mm -hmm. um, and i know of at least one management company right now that's actually looking for someone specifically on the to, to market on the F&B side, right? Like mm -hmm. that, you know, it, traditionally your digital e-commerce has been hotel, but they want something that's going to focus on their restaurants and how do we grow that revenue, which I think is really interesting to you yeah. know, see as things start to come back. And I'm noticing a lot of hotels that have restaurants are truly, to your point, bringing out the fact of we need a local market. It's one thing that we're attached to this hotel. It's one of the things that we operate and service those that are at the hotel. But in reality, for our sustainability, we need a local presence as well. It's not a new conversation. It's not like this is a new revelation for some restaurants, but it seems to be more in the forefront of dialogue about restaurant solutions for hotels. It's like, look, I'll give a case an example. There's a restaurant that's a, pretty much a brand box up in Indianapolis that has a really cool restaurant attached to it as part of the hotel. Um, that is in a major metro area that there's a lot of, of drive traffic that they could tap into. We threw in a Waze program for them, and it's been like, oh, you're here? And they pull in. They didn't know it existed, and they didn't think of it. In con they see the brand hotel flag. They don't see the rest of the restaurant flag. And they turn into it to that point. And then by the same token, they have another hotel that's a little farther south in a different metro that the restaurant is the draw, and they're like, oh, you're attached to a hotel. It's kind of a, you know, every place is different. And every place has a different focus, but it, it, there's a lots of cool tools that, that can work for that. Yeah, that reverse situation was definitely true at the Hotel Elise in New York, where we had the Monkey Bar. Okay. Mm. The Monkey Bar, so famous. Everybody has uh, who lives in New York uh, has old stories about their grandparents met there, or my father used to take me here whenever it was at my birthday, or something amazing like that, and. Uh, it, it, it was, and you know what, every restaurant uh, deserves to have its own identity and, and, and be sold and thought about as its own business. I remember when I was at the Drake Hotel in New York, uh, we had a restaurant with a very a, a famous chef that I will mention right now, that but it was not a money making situation. It was definitely a prestige situation and an attraction and situation, but it wasn't a money making situation. I think it's 
much easier to have a money making situation when you rent out the restaurant to actual, you know, restaurateurs that have to make it on their own right. I have a question, and this is more to you, Melissa, because I, I, I enticed you to join today specifically because of the app denial app article, which really wasn't. It was just you know, clickbait candy, the title, because it really didn't make it its point. I, I don't think it made its point at all, to be honest with you. It was just fun to tease you with the idea that there was an article out there that said apps are in the decline. Um, and I'll share the link and just say I was actually making a note for our last conversation, but we, we, we have a reality. We have talked about this many times on Clubhouse as well, and we've talked about on the show here. Labor is a, it was an issue before, and it's now even a larger issue now. And there is going to be a, a point where we're not going to be able to service the demand, even after the tsunami of demand that some places are facing now, because there's just a lack of interest of people working in our industry. And that's going to be potentially pervasive for a while, enough so that we may be, have to re-strategize about what other ways we can solve stuff. That brings up the app question. Technology. Is technology the, you know, the, the knight in shining armor that saves the day by coming in and supplanting some of the service requirements that we're not able to attain with warm bodies um, in, in doing things. Do you see with what you guys do with your app uh, for the hotel, expanding its function to help the food services of a hotel to better operate as well, where the menu is available, the ability to charge it to your room is available, um, you know, that kind of functionality, do you, do you, are you guys putting that on a roadmap of consideration or is this just a, we'll, we'll see it if we think we need it or how you guys are looking at something like that? I'm not privy to the roadmap of the app, but if we are smart, then the answer is yes, because absolutely. And this actually came up in the 8 a.m. clubhouse this morning about uh, restaurants and the whole fact that people are understaffed. And what if you just had a QR code at the table where you could, put in your order on your phone and it went to the kitchen and then your wait staff brought it out. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you do that? I begged for that, uh, that feature in our hotels because we had the rooftop bars and you know what, if it's wide, if it's busy, if there are like different levels and different areas for people to go to, it's hard to have human eyeballs at every single place. But when I went to, uh, to to Asia and was staying at, at a hotel where there was an unmanned area, very lovely and secluded lounge chairs, it was so easy. Technology, there was just a little, there was a little sign there. You scan the QR code. You 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 let them know that you need a drink or a towel or whatever you wanted. And, and there it was for you. It was wonderful. You had the human service there, but you don't need to tie up a human sitting in a, a, a place where there's nothing going on so much of the time. Everybody has more important things to do until there's a guest there. And then please, it, it's such a wonderful thing to be able to know that you need to go to table 39, which is up the stairs around the corner and a little a little nook. Well, we've there all been to look. Go ahead, Dean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There, there, there used to be an old restaurant here in Norfolk, Nebraska, where I live. It was called the Double K Restaurant. And it was a very novelty thing back in the time where you would go there and you'd sat in your booths and each booth had a telephone receiver on it. And that phone only went to one place. You couldn't dial out anywhere, just went to the back to the kitchen. And so you had your menu. And when you were ready to order, you just picked up that receiver and placed your order. No waiter or waitress ever came by your table except for to, to deliver the food. So that was kind of a low tech version of doing the same thing. We've all been to LaGuardia uh, when they made the revamp and you had the tables that had the tablets, which we all know you don't want to invest in hardware because it's so much expensive to maintain because people beat the bejeebers out of it. But to your thought process, that was a technology solution for a scalability issue. When they spread out the seating capacity of their food operations, it made it logistically difficult for servers to actually facilitate the constant communication necessary to a table. Hi, the welcoming. I mean, you have five points of contact for a restaurant, uh, for a table in general. Point, you know, first content is meet and greet. Second is initial uh, um, acquisition of beverages or starting point. Third is the, the menu reservation uh, or the menu selection process. Fourth is delivery. Fifth is conclusion. Basic five that you run with the table. So 
you, you can expand on those more and on and on, but that's the basic core to it. So if you can reduce the frequency of connection to the table where you're reducing it down to two or three of those, two being the primary one that LaGuardia did, which is delivery of food and beverage. That's it. Because everything else was facilitated by, you know, you, there's no Greek requirement. It's a matter of functionality of this is what I want. And then you had the follow-up of, you know, payment, which is also handled at that tablet point. Um, I don't think in some ways some restaurants need to go that direction because, and this breaks down to a little bit too, we, we've taken what we do for restaurants and said that it has to work in every condition. That a Chili's, because I like picking on them, is just the same as going to a high-end restaurant uh, where you're looking for the engagement of service. Chili's is a function. The beer's cold, the food is averagely tasty, and the bill comes easy at the end. And they recognized it to a certain degree because they put that little dinky thing in the in the table that says if you want to serve, you can hit the little button. <laughs> doesn't ever work, which is the fall down. But yeah, you can bang that like a monkey. Just, and it never doesn't work. But um, the idea of it was good. And that was, look, I can let the server know when there's something needed rather than the catching the eye contact or whatever. And we've also talked about the fact that there's other things that we can do technology-wise that will improve the engagement. There's two fail points for every server. There's the delay in greet and there's the delay in, in conclusion of service. Those are the two gr most critical. And the delay in service is the one that hurts the server the worst because they could have done very good up to the point of where they were not there at the time that the person needed to leave. And that's the thing they remember most when they're writing the tip. So if you can expedite that, like we were talking about the tabbed out platform that I was, that I was talking about, um, where you can identify that you use that platform, your method of payment is already included in it. You can literally see your tab and you choose when you go to leave, you can choose and tip and be done and walk out. And the server knows that you didn't walk out because it pings them, letting them know that, hey, that person paid. We're good. Don't chase them down the, the street. Okay. And it makes it efficient to also splitting the bill with people and all this other stuff. So technology can help with these points of contact for the type of business the restaurant may be doing. Nothing replaces an acknowledgement of a bartender to a restaurant you or a bar that you've gone to at a time that you're just like coming in and they just like, hey, Lauren, you know, Norm. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I've seen so many servers crying in the bathroom. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible thing to witness. I've been in hotel restaurants where the server is crying to me that over and over again, she keeps telling them that things need to change and she has people angry at them all the time. And, and why don't they make things easier for, for the servers to actually do a good job? It is so painful. They want to do the right thing, uh, but, but we don't give them the, the tools to be successful mm -hmm. and technology tools are so important. It's not that we need less servers. We need more servers <laughs> to, to be equipped to do great work. So people feel great about coming back again. I mean, how many times, and, and also we're not maximizing our revenue. When, when you walk in and there's a group of servers talking to each other try, uh, about whatever, and it's taking them a whole long while before they even come up to you and sit you down. And then it takes a long time before the person who's officially uh, the one supposed to bring you the drink uh, and the menu brings you the menu. And then it wait, you know, you're waiting for somebody to take your order. You've lost a full drink uh, at least before you finally tick the order for the drink and the food, brought them at the same time, you they could have been finished with their first drink and the the, the drink that comes with dinner could have been their second drink. Mm -hmm. They would you would have seen the glass emptying and brought them a second drink or a third drink at this point before they left. But by the time you came, they've already almost finished their meal. So they're not going to order another glass of wine. But that, um, yeah, it's giving them the time to be able to do that. Because I mean, for me, I drink iced tea, like I have a, a hole in my leg or something. I just, I mean, I'm like, I mean, I, as soon as they give me the tea, I'm finishing before they even finish giving the drinks to the rest of the people. And they're like, oh, you're thirsty, aren't you? And it's like, yep. I it's said, a house it might be a recommendation, you just leave a picture. Because <laughs> I want to bug the beavers out of you the entire time you're here. And they end up doing like, boom, here's a picture. It's like, yeah. I tip them because it's like, look, I'm looking to the fact that I don't want to have to be constantly looking for, for tea. That's my thing. I love iced yeah. tea. 
but but you know, we, you know, Dean, I, I think I've shared this with you when we were in Shanghai. I don't think you went to the restaurant with me when I did this, but there there was a restaurant I went to in Shanghai that there was nobody there. I mean, literally, we chat handled everything. I went in and and ordered before I got there. Actually, I got directions and got a pit to ride all on WeChat, and then I got there. I ordered on WeChat. I sat down where I was supposed to sit down. My order came up, and a little conveyor belt was in a U shape through the place. My food came up and told me what bin was out. Took it out, ate it, didn't finish it, paid for it, and left. And not seeing a single person. There was not a person in there. The only people in there that were working that were human or was in the back where they're probably microwaving the food and putting it in a plant. No, they, they just it. But it was that efficiency that the restaurant was for. I don't want that if I'm going out with friends and I want to, because we, we talked about this and it goes to the hotels as well. It's about the story. It's about why you were there. There's a functional requirement of our industry. And then there's the story of our industry of where I stayed, what I did, what I enjoyed, what I partic- you know, participated in that requires service. But there should be some technology that helps augment some of that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And people are um, also, for some reason, a lot of places are still having their servers actually deliver the food to the table sometimes when they would have made things more expedient, easier, more convenient, uh, you know, less, less fresh, less friction points, friction points. I can't even speak today. Uh, if they if they just had runners putting it out faster. It, but then the detriment is the runners not coming to the table and auction the food if it wasn't you know, that, that, that also is a deterrent for me that I've ordered. And I understand runners, that means my food comes out hot. But then the runner's like, who gets the burger? <laughs> Honestly, that's an age old <laughs> service yeah. thing that you did. You did clockwise order taking. So, you know, one o'clock is this, two o'clock is that, three o'clock is that, whatever. But, uh, Tim, you're going to say something. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was say, well it, it goes to your the point of, right, how do we provide better service, but everyone has slightly different needs. You're, you know, you're in Shanghai, but like, Sometimes I'm traveling on business. Like I just, just give me my food. Like I'm tired. I'm. I just want to eat and, and go or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then there are times where, hey, I'm with a big old group, and I don't care. Like I want you to take time between the appetizer and the meal and the, you know, and multiple drinks. Um, so, but it's, it's how do how do we set up to be able to to take advantage of servicing based on what that guest really actually needs. The same thing with hotels. I'm one of those people, I don't need daily housekeeping. I love how that's become the new Mm -hmm. marketing, like for your safety, but let's be real, for our cost savings, because we don't have enough employees. I mean- You mean like like, save the towels, that program? (laughs) Yeah, all all that kind of stuff. But I mean, I'm one, if I'm only staying in your hotel for a couple of days, like don't bother, I I don't need housekeeping. I don't wanna, I don't wanna have to put my electronics away. I don't wanna have to hide stuff, but not that I, but you know, I just, just let me be and, and I'll strip the bed down before I leave and put all the trash in a nice neat little corner, but. Yep. You and I do the same kind of travel me. thing because when I when I go go somewhere, I actually literally repack my suitcase. I mean, I'll leave things in the closet and stuff, but I'll literally repack all my personal stuff into my suitcase and put the suitcase in the closet with my clothes that are hanging because I know from having cleaned rooms, the less of the person's personal effects are on all the things I got to clean, the the easier and faster it is for me to get that room done because I don't have to work around their stuff, their things they left around the sink or the the things that left on the countertop. Plus also it totally alleviates suspicion of where did I leave that? And then all of a sudden you're thinking it was not, you know, somebody else may have, you know, the team may have come in or whatever. Uh, it, it, Cause it, anyway, but yeah, I do the I same thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we also know the dark side of the industry as well. I yeah. don't want anybody touching my computer or my gadgets or my chargers or anything like that. And, you know, I, 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 I clean my place once a week. You know, obviously not the kitchen, but the but the the rest can just go once a week. They making the bed, for example, and uh, I so I don't need more than that. Can we start a global movement to get larger garbage cans in hotel rooms? Oh come <laughs> on! Five I mean, you five can one one empty water so much bottle better. and your garbage is full. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, 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 or you have them all over the place. And I feel bad because I don't want to trash out five different garbage cans. But by the same token, to your point, the little dinky one ain't cutting it. And, you know, yeah, it doesn't hold. But it's it's funny. First off, uh, Tammy, uh, I hope I'm so looking forward to uh, the, the conferences. And so it's my benchmark of my first conference I want to go to. However, that being said, I no matter how brilliant you probably will put the content up together, I'm probably going to be more about chasing people down for group hugs. 
than I am about actually going to any sessions. <laughs> I gotta I'll be like, oh, yeah. I don't know how much work I will get done there, but yeah. I want to be there. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it, it's going to be more about getting to see people again. I mean, it, it, you're right. I think it, it, I hope for HSMI, for everybody, high tech, everybody else, that this turns into a benchmark conference time that high tech gets record attendance and record information and that, uh, that the marketing conference and the rock conference all symbiotically work well together, that everybody gets to truly do all the stuff that they're looking forward to. Because I'm driving, I'm not flying for lots of reasons, but you know, we're gonna drive out, Dallas is home, or used to be home. So we know a lot of people, friends, and, and, and I have compatriots that I work with and clients I still work with. So there's a lot of reasons to be in Dallas for that whole time and beyond. But I really, you know, like, okay, for the live broadcast I used to do, the cool part is now we have a TV channel. So whenever I do live broadcast, it'll go on the channel as well, which would be kind of fun because then I'm going to be literally grabbing everybody. Come here, you know, to be the camera because it'll be an excuse to see everybody. That's the thing I'm looking forward to the most is really just seeing everybody in person and talking and hanging out and going out to grab a lunch or whatever with people, you know? Yeah. Is that it, you take great. so much for granted. I think I watched, you know, the, the Hunter, uh, conference was what last week we again yeah. my days are all melding and um i was telling you know stephanie smith was there and i was telling i'm like i'm so jealous I you know. want to see people in person i got <laughs> dying um yeah. i i think dallas will most likely be my first business conference in person yeah. um we're taking a personal road trip next month but I'm, I'm flying because California to Texas is a little bit of a different stretch. Uh, but yeah. That's, What's the desert in the summer? What? Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and then I'm also, so I'm, uh, the timing worked out. Uh, I will then be flying from Dallas to Orlando and spending the weekend at Disney World celebrating their 50th anniversary. So I'm doing, what do, what do they call those? Like, uh, but by leisure, pleasure, yeah, pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pleasure. You know the the, uh, the cool part I think about the conferences that will be enjoyed. But I th I think going back to the way it was, we're all long longing for the things that we're familiar from that context. But I also think from an efficiency point of view, this isn't going to go away. It's going to diminish. I run, and I think and for a while it may even go artificially low because people are going to want to replace this with the reality of actually engaging with people in person. But I think out of efficiencies, this durability is there to stay. I think we have we have moved and shifted a little bit of our business dialogue to be more blended between these things. Uh, it, just out of efficiencies, I mean, I can't go to London to talk to somebody I know in London right now. But this is this is the solution. And not that it wasn't that beforehand, but this is also people have become very familiar. I for all of us that have done these for a long time. Prior to COVID, it was like, make sure your microphones, yeah, don't go with the light behind your head. You know, do you have a camera on? You take the little thing. We go through these rituals of of educating the logistics of doing these things. Now it's like, dude, you gotta have this stuff figured out. Cause if not, you're not doing business. Cause you gotta know you have to have a camera and no cover and a microphone or whatever. You know, you need these things. So we've gotten a little bit more comfortable with this dialogue space, but I think for a while it's going to be about group hugs. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Any insights as to what's going on in the agenda, Tammy? Just things, maybe a little in peaks? Um, yeah, I mean, we're it, so the committee is working really hard to to put together an agenda that covers a lot of topics that are very front of mind. So we're doing a lot of work on. Uh, topics around uh, all the first party clicky data, uh, different, and in a variety of sessions around privacy, around marketing on it. Um, I don't want to give, you know, too much away, but Medicine. really, yeah. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> bless you. I, I, I think I may have heard your name mentioned once or twice or twice times. So Don't forget your friends. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, so, you came up on my Google photo album the other day because of you on stage. I snapped a picture when you had the big HSMAI logo. Oh. Yeah. And it, it made me smile. I mean, I got to be honest with you. It made me, I mean, that was the last, one of the last, I mean, I mean the last conference I went to before all the heck broke loose was the uh, Navigate conference with uh, Navis. But prior to that was the, the marketing conference and yeah. you were on it. And one of the pictures I took with my phone other than my camera on a stick was you on stage. 
you know, and it came up in my Google photo album as it rotates through. And I'm like, and it, just, it made me smile. It's like, yeah, that was cool. You know, there's I was so happy they recorded it because I wasn't there. I was moving my parents that week, but I really appreciated your presentation being on the recording for yep, everyone. Yep. 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 It, it, on the yeah. HSMAI website. And, and a lot of people still like I've reposted that a couple times on I mean the the content behind that is still so relevant even to you know even a year plus mm -hmm. later and I'll, and so I was thrilled that they actually recorded it and you know mm -hmm. that is one of the things we're working on right now too so um, if anyone has a topic and, and broader audience do feel free to message me one of the things we do is what's called lightning rounds and so the uh, the session I did last year was on marketing in a zero click world and what's so much fun, and I'm gonna fun me. Anyway, uh, you have hey, we all have our own fun slides. levels, okay? It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> you have 20 slides and, and they automatically advance. So you're not controlling your own clicker. It's every 20 seconds there's a new slide. And so you have to have your timing down, but it's great for a a topic to really kind of hone in quickly on a subject and you're only speaking for six minutes and 40 seconds. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not where you're prepping for an hour long presentation or anything. Along it's the, the hardest line. presentation you put it together. It is the hardest. It is the hardest. <laughs> it is you, the hard you have to practice and practice and practice. It's, it's, cr I've never worked so hard for a well, presentation. Okay. I, know. Okay. I told you this already, Tammy, but I, you know, I cheated when I did mine. <laughs> Um, because I couldn't fit my, you know, me talking with a time frame. So just, I don't know how that works. So, so what I did was I put a sneaky progress bar on the bottom of the screen that would go along. That was my timer to how much time I have for it. And then I modified the time per slide that I wanted to talk. It still was in six minutes, but each slide had a different time amount because I could change the time sequence of the slide before transition. And then I could see how long I was going with it. So I knew I didn't overstep the slide. So yeah. um, just like Captain and Kirk, you cheating. Kobe to, Yashimaru, Kobe Yashimaru. Man. <laughs> but, you know, the way that presentation is supposed to be is that it's 20 images. And a lot of times you'll still get uh, see people with all the crammed in bullet points and everything. And yeah. I, I don't think that that's the point of the 2020. The bad, point of the 2020 version, yeah. is fun picture that kind of anchors what the person is saying, not yeah. writes so down best, what the person is saying. Yeah, the best presentations are the ones that if you're given the slide deck, you don't know the presentation. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yes. The visualization the and augmentation of the discussion. Not because yeah. when you start doing deck. bullet points and stuff, <laughs> you're competing with the audience as to how fast you read it versus how yeah. fast they read it. Yeah. And, and they're distracted because they're wanting to see what you're talking about and stop listening to you. But if you have that, because some of my the presentations that I love, I go to look at the deck that they shared, and it's like picture of a puppy, picture of a human. <laughs> and I'm like, I no use. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a whole different context to it. But that's the cool part about it is good presentations like that. To your point, Nadal, it's like images are an augmentation to the discussion. The discussion is at a pace. But I thought you knocked it out of the park time. Yeah, and I told you that before. I keep telling you that. It's like that, you know, I think you, the, the, taking such an item as that and saying I have six minutes to make it clear, <laughs> it's like explain the universe, give two examples. <laughs> and you, <have> six minutes. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, you, and, and I, and Adele, to your point, hardest presentation I've ever prepped for, right? I mean, it, Partially because I, I have a little bit of Lauren in me and I'm I tend to be a bit long winded and just kind okay. of go, you know, kind of go with the flow. And so but you had you have to be on par and you didn't cheat, Lauren. Like I was even told like, oh, you could do the same slide twice. So you have 40 seconds. Like, like there were things you could do, but you have six minutes and 40 seconds total. Um, and I will tell you that. Like the night before, I mean, I, I won top 25 that year. That whole night was a blur because I was so focused and nervous about the lightning round. And once it was over, I was like, oh, but I'm so glad I did it. It was such a cool thing to do and to be up on stage and, and just really like, I'll do it again in in a few years right like it's yeah. not something that i would commit to doing every year it yeah. was hard it but is. i definitely i encourage people uh absolutely if you haven't done one and hard they give you help like like my group had 
uh, um, we, we had a, a mentor that someone that's done them several times and really was so invaluable. Um, you know, I, Kelly McGuire is so invaluable as far as guidance and advice and, um, just little tricks and, and nuggets to make it so that it was a good presentation. And she was really good about, because let's, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes you you've talked about a topic for so long that it's so second nature to you. And I still remember going through my first draft with her and her being like, okay, this is great, but what is this P you know, like piece? And mm -hmm. so really worked with me to more powerfully tell the story to an audience that may not have understood the concepts. You all get what schema is and kind of some of the basics behind the presentation, but for people who didn't, like we're really understanding that and how important it is to us as marketers. Anybody can build a pretty website. How yeah. do you actually, you know, get that website to be found so that you can make money off of it? You right. That's the key. For me, I, I use the power of passion and uh, fire hose. Uh, and, you know, it's like, there's everything, you know, and really excited about it. And I know I lose them on purpose, you know, almost on purpose, because it, the idea of it is I don't think I can explain it for full functionality after whatever time has been given to me, hour, half hour, whatever it is. But I want them to realize there's resources that they can dive into, which is why I always make sure my presentations have way more than I can get to so they can go back to them later and say, oh, that's what he's talking, you know, or to walk away going, dang, I don't know what he talked about. He lost me after the first five. But if I need to know about that stuff, I got to go find that guy and ask him again. That's how I kind of do it. But to your point, when you have to crucible it down to what is the core elements of what I'm trying to convey in a way that's understandable, because I think I, I add on to a presentation because of the feedback I get from having done that presentation elsewhere and the refinement of it. And I said, oh, I missed, didn't really clarify that. Let me add that into the next time I do this. And then you keep adding and you create this onion layer. And what you end up doing sometimes is, for me anyway, I make it more confusing by trying to hit all the points that I know were not understood to the point that I lose the purpose of what I'm trying to explain. That's my flaw. I, I, I do that where all of a sudden it's like, that's great, Lauren, but I don't know what you're trying to bring me to. And so to your point, doing a six minute or, or a, somebody that evaluates what you're saying and brings it down to, that's nice, but I don't think I think that everyone's going to understand that. And at first you can be like, whoa, 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 where, who are you to tell me? Then if you take it with the spirit that's intended of, okay, if I, I couldn't make you understand it, or if you felt that it wasn't able to be understood, I need to take that to heart and say, what am I doing wrong? How am I not conveying what I know so well? Because all of us, and I give credit to everyone, you could throw us in any stage at any time and talk about anything. We all have some perspective on something we've had to deal with. The reality of it is, do we do a good job of making sure people understand how we understand it? That's where we can, that's why I feel on some things where I'll be like, yay. And then everyone's like, what? <laughs> so it is kind of a neat presentations and doing it well, like you did yours, Tammy, is very hard to get from point A to point Z in the time that's given with the clarity that you gave on a topic that is not like explain the color blue. It's like, this is a hard thing for people to understand because there's so many prior knowledgeable components that are necessary, like schema and things like this, to understand how this works. But you did a great job of value, process, ability, and, and and conclusion that in six minutes was really, really good. So, I mean, I know I keep complimenting you, but it really was a very impressive display of true insight to the topic. You know, yeah, one, one, you. Of the, you. one of the very best presentations that I've ever seen was actually at a rock conference a couple of years ago. And I was trying to jog my memory what city it was in, but they had a revenue management wrap that they did on stage. Yeah. I would love to find the video of that somewhere. It oh. was amazing. I loved it. I loved um, it. You know what's your name from Las Vegas has it? Um, Kelly? I'll find yeah. it. I, I, there is one. There is actually one. Um, yeah, and then, you know, to, to bring this up, also the format of how you present the content is interesting. To this day, I still get people that remind me of a conversation I had with Calvin Anderson 10 years ago, maybe. <laughs> at a rock conference and where we did um, uh, point counterpoint kind of content where he was the revenue manager and I was the marketer. And we did the, you know, uh, Dan Aykroyd, Jane Curtin dialogue, basically, you know, it's like, that's nice, but if you're as ignorant as I think you are kind of thing. Uh, and we went back and forth and people still tell me about how they finally understood what marketing could help revenue for and how revenue could help marketing just by the format of how it was done. 
it really wasn't so much the content because the content changes every year as to what it was, but the format of understanding the the, the, the differences but similarities was it, it conveyed to people. So, yeah, it's it's kind of neat when you hit magic like that. Um, I yeah. do want to Melissa. I do need to ask about uh, some things. I have some personal interest into some platforms that I'm using, and but I want to ask you about apps in a larger sense of what we talked about. If that's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, well, apps save the universe. Well, I mean, no, I, uh, <laughs> you guys have a fully functional single platform booking engine app. Okay. And right now we're dealing with authenticity of domain authentication because of course your booking engine is not on your website. So you have to authenticate the booking engine in your process. Good luck well, with that. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass, uh, st but, but it took us. Okay, and um, it's going well. I mean, we are going through the process and, and each platform is getting better at doing what they do. They're offering up better solutions than they first proposed. So it is working itself out in some ways. That being said, what is the growth that you guys see with what you're doing for the demands that we're emerging on this demand cycle right now? There are hotels that are just can't keep up and they're going to hurt themselves. And like in the Dell, you can talk to this on their service scores. How can apps right now? Yeah. Is there any, is there any tech solution that you guys see that you're, like I said, you're not, you're saying you're not privy to the roadmap of how the app is going to develop, but Obviously, from a dialogue perspective, you have a working, functioning, usable program right now that can be attached to, it can be added to, it can be doing things to. Do you guys see that? I mean, no, I know we talk about restaurants and stuff, and that's one thing, but in general, is there things that you guys are looking at the app expanding its capabilities of doing that you can share? Uh, this is what I will tell you about what I know versus what I don't know. <laughs> I know that the clients that are using our app are honestly doing a piss poor way of using the app. It's barely being promoted. And in spite of that, we're still getting downloads, check-ins, checkouts, and a poop load of revenue being booked through the app. I like poop load, I like that. I'm gonna take that Including one. additional load. services. So not just rooms, but add-ons. Mm. They're okay. not using it. They're not using the SMS functionality. Like nobody's sending push notes. There, there's just nobody has, nobody wants to spend the time. Maybe nobody has the time. Like I'm going to go with the benefit of the doubt. People don't have time on top of everything else going on to develop an app strategy. So could there be more usage of these apps? A thousand percent. Yes. There could be. Do I see it happening tomorrow? I, I don't. I hope people will embrace it more because I do see the potential there. But again, we can't even get the basics right now. Wow. So it's really tough. Tammy, how do you guys? I'm sorry, go ahead. What do you think it is? Do you think it's a matter of educating the team more? Is it a matter that they don't feel the ownership of that area that everybody thinks it's somebody else's job to do it or they're just in their comfort zone doing whatever they're doing and they're afraid to venture into something I think else? It's both. I think it's the, the silos of operations versus marketing. Like who, so who's responsible for those SMS messages? And we have tried, I don't know if I'm sharing secrets I shouldn't share, but I'm, we're all friends here. <laughs> yeah. We have tried working with clients, literally training the teams, trying to set up a strategy for these messages, and it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. I, and so I don't know what's happening on that side that's preventing it from happening, but it's not happening. And but I think that you're very office. close to it when you talk about silos. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I, I know, sorry, no, I know that that's the problem with, uh, reputation management. Yeah. Yeah, it really is one of the biggest challenges of any software as a service provider out there is not your competition, it's your user apathy. Yeah. Yeah, so you can have the greatest app in the world and if nobody's using it, it, it doesn't even matter if your guy across the street has a better one, it's still same thing. If nobody's using it, then, then it comes time to renewal and they're looking at it like, well, we didn't use it. You know, Tammy, I, I channeled something from a discussion you and I had a long time ago of what I would tell people when they were frustrated with their platform usages and so forth. 
I first question I asked, and this comes out of a conversation you and I had over a beer. So there you go. Um, was when was the last time they got trained? I mean, honestly, it boiled down to, you know, when was the last time you actually knew what the, the platform did? You brought that up a lot of times when we talk about frustration of uh, customer engagement and their frustrations with their their account manager or something like, well, they're not t- telling us what we need to know. We're doing what we need to know. And it's like, you know, you, you were saying you started making people ask, you know, well, when was the last time you got trained as to what it did do? And you often found that the person you were talking to was third generation trained, which makes them 10 percent efficient on what they actually knew the software could actually do. Or they didn't even know that they could ask questions that they weren't asking because they never were told that they could. So, yeah. uh, Can I just share that? So in spite of the non-marketing and all the things, one hotel using our app, and this is going to poke a hole in that stupid research article. (laughs) I knew I got a please poke holes. We're under your saddle on that one. Uh, one last week, one of our properties using our hotel app booked one, one, one booking for eight thousand dollars. Dang, eight thousand dollars, one Dang. booking. And so okay. I'm sorry, I, I need to share that article. Booking several thousand dollars per booking. Yeah. Actually, do you have the article right there with you? Because I got to go dig it up. But just to, to know what we're talking about, yesterday's Clubhouse I brought up just to tease Melissa to get her in here to talk today, especially about this, was an article popped up that said that um, apps statistically are showing a diminishment in value or, or, or contribution because of how they're being used. And, and the example they were giving was the fact that most users at an income level to be determined, uh, we're only using it for baseline efficiencies and hence buying retail uh, uh, discounted or promotional aspects that the app was offering. And so the app was actually diminishing the value of the conversions by its usage. And and sure, it's like giving a key to a spaceship to somebody that strikes it on a rock to make a fire. You're missing the point. It makes this thing fly, not makes fire down here. You know, the app is supposed to be doing these things. I can tell you, and the reason why I asked all this stuff, I mean, I'm glad, but it was so amazing that these combinations of conversation that we have this today, is I tried to do for free stuff. I figured here's my here here's my logic in trying to offer whatever I could do to help somebody. Was just like you said, internally they don't have the time or the capacity or the willingness to admit their inability to understand what they're even being asked to do. I tried to disclose everything from their side, saying. And this goes from a social media perspective. We did. We try to do social media champions. We try to have people engaged at the property to do postings and to do content and share content. I give them platforms to share media on, and it was just space, you know, keys to a spaceship that nobody used. And so I thought, okay, so if they're not going to want to do it for themselves, and the people that are having me do work for them aren't not having any position to do it themselves either, let me just come in and do it. And the first resistance I got is, well, you just want to charge more for what you're doing by taking saying that you're going to do it. So I said, no, I'm going to do it for free. I'm going to do whatever I can to help you do this. I'm going to give you the platform. We're going to build the platform. And even I had to get the resistance. Well, you're just going to do this. You can charge us there. No, I'm doing it for free. Okay. I'll write it on a piece of paper for you. I'm doing it for free. Okay. I could be selling silver dollars for 50 cents and nobody's buying. I mean, seriously, I'm sitting there going, dudes, I'm literally going to do this for you. And yet you can't give me the time for what I need to actually get it done for you. It's like, here's the water. You can, you're thirsty, right? Drink. Nope. Much rather just sit here and die, wither and die. It, it is a mind numbing lack of awareness. And even when I show them numbers of return on value of stuff, like, look, you give me a dollar, I'll give you 20. Well, how many dollars do you want to give me? Nope. <laughs> yeah, I think part of the problem, Lauren. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Adele. Go ahead. You go ahead. Well, when I say for for every person like you that really wants to help and really wants to to educate and and do these things, there's three, four others in the background that aren't as altruistic, yeah. that aren't a, you know, and so you've got a lot of people that have been burned over the yeah. years That's and, true. and 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 I am like you're like, you're like oh, you boy. know, we, you know. Um, and so sometimes I think, and, and, and let's be real, like, like, in 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 my space, everyone says the same, like we do SEO, we do. And it's like, no, no, <laughs> no, you know, it's like, oh yes, they may check this box, but it's the difference between a uh, first grade level and 12th grade calculus, right? Like, mm. but 
okay, well, they can check a box that says they have this certain thing. And then most to your point, you've got this great app that does all these wonderful things and people are using 10% of the of what it's capable of, right? And so um, I know we actually hired a, a person whose sole responsibility as our hotel solutions person is to figure out all of the features of things that we do and how to get our clients to better utilize the features mm -hmm. that they have and then how to help communicate value of everything we're doing. Where So where there is an opportunity that makes sense, we can partner them with, with the right things that will help them. And you're right, we don't, we don't have a mobile app. We don't have any intention of having a mobile app, but we do progressive web app as part of the site build. And the messaging component, no one, no one's doing it. <laughs> it's like pulling It's teeth. bizarre, like, look, it is. Look. Yeah. I and it's such a useful many... function too. I mean, anything that we do with bots, we have an SMS component to it and it is used. And the part that we end up getting caught on is that we end up having to fill the gap of what they didn't do for themselves. We have to go in and create the supplement. We actually end up having to be the dialogue. You know, it's like, guys, these people are talking to you on this platform that you wanted, that you thought was all keen, whiz bingy. And yes, it is because we told you it was, but you're not doing what you said you're going to do with it. We're the ones having to answer this dialogue. We're the ones having to. So then we started creating logic strings for them to be automated in some dialogue on some things on a level one basis. And then all of a sudden they go over and and, and, and they, they get all this business and they have gotten business from it. And, and uh, they're like, well, what do we have to do? Okay, now that you're paying attention, this is what you need to do, you know, and, and participate in it. But it is amazing how you do offer the keys. And I'm so happy you guys are, I, I, I think I was calling client advocacy, but I'm glad you guys have really done that because that to me is such a critical component of client fatigue. They're, they're so familiar having worked with you, they lose track of why they're with you. And, 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 and it's good that somebody goes in and says, hey, look, you're not using some of this stuff and we have this and you're paying for it and you can use it. You're just not using it and you need to do this kind of stuff. And my analogy to what you say is, is like a, a car driver. Yes, you can drive a car. Can you drive a car in an Indianapolis 500 race? Nope. But if you're a driver, you can say that just like you said with SEO. Oh, I do SEO. Yeah, but it's not like driving a race car. <laughs> you know, it's not the same thing. It's a little different driving, a little different skill set needed for doing what we do. So yeah, it, it's, well, now that we solve world peace. <laughs> I really think, though, it, uh, it, it presents a case for why hotel owners and hotel general managers need to have some skin in the game of the whole sales, marketing, revenue, guest experience arena. Because for the full potential of revenue generation to happen, they need to be leading the way saying, yes, I want you to own this. I want you to don't just stay in your your job is not this series of tasks. The owner of the library hotel collection didn't tell me your job is to go knock on doors or to uh, create advertisements. He just says you're responsible for the financial health of the company and, and feel as though you own it and do what needs to be done. And for that reason, every company that we worked with almost uh, is at one point or another saying wow your guys are really super users of our product like you know stuff about how to how to make something happen on our product that if i called customer support they couldn't even tell me how to do because when we had something we wanted to get done we owned it we huddled about it how are we going to use this system to diy all the fancy things that the big companies are doing that they're creating their own technology and we can't do that but we're going to diy that that concept using the tools that we have and it's it just makes such a huge difference i've heard it so many times about our team because everybody owned it and and knew that whatever it takes we're going to find a, a a way of presenting our material creatively uh, there's 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 something missing because people are like this is what i do i wake up in the morning and then i i go to the office i do this this and this and 
and and the only thing that they maybe want to do is occasionally buy something but not necessarily do something different because their their list of tasks has been pre-designated but you know what we have to break away from that we have to actually innovate and you'll find yourself five years from now doing completely th different things than we're doing today, even one year from now. If you just keep an open mind to how can we grow a little bit every day and do things different? And it's, it's amazing how budget restrictions always come into play with that, even when it's the most sensible thing in the world. Like Lauren was saying earlier, I'm going to sell you a silver dollar for 50 cents. And people still go, no, 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 can do it. And uh, I, I use because I do meta search, I use the example of meta search for a lot of examples that if you're if you have a 12% cost of sale on something, but it has a limited budget, and you're setting that off to instead take it at a 15% cost of sale, why would you do that? Right? You're just I'm gonna shut this off and I'm gonna take the more expensive one, I'll shut this up because you don't have but people have budgets, right? You have things that you have to work around. I wish we did and wish it could be uncapped. It should be uncapped, but it's not. It's just the reality that we have to work with. You know, I had that happen that somebody, many times people would come to me and they would say, I'll give you this uh, free for a year. We'll give you all the equipment. We'll give you the training. We'll, there's not going to be any cost to you for, for a whole year. And then, you know, we'll discuss after that if you want to keep it or not, just so that they can say that we implemented it and, and what the response was from our guests and how mm -hmm. we enjoyed it. Case study, yeah. And yet, people, uh, you know, general managers just said, I don't have time to deal with this. Right. I think it goes to Tammy's skepticism point that they've been burned enough with the bait and switch or the lead, uh, you know, uh, thing of dependency and all this, and people do get negative to it. Sorry, I'm a little distracted because I'm sure like all pet owners, I'm well-trained. And um, my dog has an APA watch uh, which is reminding him that uh, daddy gives him a cookie about now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did, but he's thinking because I gave it to him in a different way, like it was in my pocket, there must be more there. <laughs> so it's more of these, no, there's no more right now. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm very well trained. I, I, I made sure I had a cookie for him so I wouldn't be missing the time schedule. His at Paul watch was going off. I've got um, this one that I have to keep in my office during these events because if I don't, she opens up the door and lets herself in. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> see, it works out really well. It, it is amazing. It, it, but the joy, every day, every day he makes me smile. Every day. They're I, the it, best. It, They're like angels. Yeah. Like oh, Mine's my gosh. Yeah. It just, yeah. So loudly, I would be surprised if you didn't hear her. And apparently, <laughs> we're the snoring is on the most recent podcast. Uh, uh, see, see, yeah, it, 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 it's one of those things. Where just like, I, it was funny when we first got him. I had a rule with uh, dogs that I've had in the past. It's like never on the bed, never on the bed. Yeah, okay, that lasted not even a day. It's like, well, yeah, for dogs, no, but not Edison. Edison gets to get on the bed, and then, of course, he wants to make sure that he um, always sleeps horiz uh, horizontal. You know, so maximum space. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but. But we can't deny the puppy cuddles. I'm sorry. There's just something about puppy cuddles. You just, you know what? Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's all good. <laughs> anyway, all right. So here's a here's a th thing that came up in conversation out of Clubhouse. I love you all's perspective on it. So um, I was with HSMAI on Tuesday. They do a live weekly thing now, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I was talking. I got on it for two weeks, and um, as a guest host or whatever it was, and. They're doing, they have an issue, which I, th I was like, wow, yeah, that's pretty neat. They have a high direct channel demand that they've never had before. Because for anybody familiar with the European market, there tend to be a wholesaler or a, a contributor market. It, they, their, their websites aren't built for direct channel as much. Uh, they relied on their wholesalers. I mean, I know from the fact my wife is, is Dutch and we go visit, every town had a travel office, like pretty much in the center of town. All that. that's, about, that's how people planned holidays, is that wholesalers were the feeders of most of the European travel market. They also have the dilemma that they not, don't really have a domestic travel market. Each country has its own restrictions. Each region in the country has their own restrictions. And even some municipalities have their own restrictions on top of that. And so, as the example was given in the dialogue, uh, somebody in Portugal, they don't have anybody local to stay at their hotel. Everybody either goes to Spain or comes from Spain or comes from France. Comes there. It's, it's a, there's very much a mix of markets that would be considered, quote, international, but really it's just domestic drive travel from different regions. 
they don't know how to broach this. And what's happening is the OTAs are beginning to fill this void quite quickly because hotels are not even mentally at a property level thinking about marketing. They just operate the hotel and business is sent to them. They pay checks to wholesalers, they pay checks to everybody else. And they're trying to figure out how to make awareness in their market of what they can do to help themselves. Problem is nobody's listening. Owners, you know, unlike unlike here domestically, we have brand dominance in markets. Okay, Marriott's, IGs, and so forth. And it's not that brands don't exist over there, but they're very fragmented. There, it's not there's not a lot, but they're very fragmented. You know, owner is in more control of what their hotels does than the brand that they own a hotel of. Uh, and so, Golden Tulip doesn't dictate what all Golden Tulips do. It's what the owner of the Golden Tulip Hotel decides what that hotel is going to do. And the owners aren't listening to this. They just want to go back to the way it was of semi business. You know, and so all these people that are looking for directions and what to do when you're at your hotel and all the stuff that we take for granted in our website design and development content doesn't exist for them. So one part of me is the evil me, which is like, Whoa, I got business everywhere I can do. And then part of me is like a little bit to the frustration I talked to earlier. Nobody's listening. They don't they're not listening to the solutions of what they can do for themselves. They just want tell me how I can turn the wholesaler back on. You know, Cooks died before COVID, so you know that already was an impact to the market. But now all these other wholesalers, they don't have scale yet either. And OTA, uh, Hotels.com, let's just be clear. Hotels.com is just eating up territory right now with, okay, we'll send you business, we'll send you business. And they're, just, their market share percentage is dramatically going up. Anything I, we can do. I agree with you completely. The, the messaging is off a lot of the time it's not as frequent as it needs to be and it's just not on point to what people want and need to hear in order to make that decision to come to your property yeah but you have to present it with puppies and if you do yes. that yes if i bring puppies gotta be a, a pet friendly hotel you've got to have another cookie dad oh puppy. my god what a beauty he's like oh yes. he's goodness. like what's going on what are you talking to, Daddy? All right, here you go. Down. No more cookies. So <sighs> Anyways, nice. yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Don't give me that look. All right, <laughs> you all know that look too. That the yeah, what the yeah. heck are you doing? I'm the center of the universe. <laughs> Anywho, it, it is it is going back to what we talked about before. The I have the keys to the universe, and nobody cares because I look at these hotels and it's like, oh my gosh. Anything you do is going to be an improvement of what you're doing right now. You have no content about what you are. You have no content about how to get information from you. You don't even have schema built. You don't have anything that's related to what people are searching you for. You don't have any optimization going on. You have no specific targeting campaigns. You have no campaigns for that matter running. Wow. You know? Call any of us. <laughs> we will help you. <laughs> it's a, it, I agree. So, if we're at a pause, I was going to Wait, hold on, Melissa. You're, you're, I mean, oh. Tammy, you're, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm not paralyzed. Try here. Right. You sound like you're a robot. Tammy the robot. <laughs> oh, no. It's the, now it's we the part where the CIA is spying on us and wants to hear what she says. No, it's, it's, it's. No. Can't hear no, you. We lost you. Go ahead, Tammy. Tammy's one. figuring it out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, see, I, I was going to bring up a different topic here real quick. Uh, if you've seen the article today, the, I think it was today, New York City is going to waive occupancy tax for visitors this summer. Wow. Thank you for that. Um, what is that, the dollar and a half uh, per night? Yeah. Well, occupancy tax in New York City is, is pretty high. I'll, I'll grant you that. But it, it sounds like a really cool thing. It's very promotable and it's kind of exciting from that perspective, but think for just a moment about the logistics of that to a hotel. So let's say you've got somebody that booked a room already for arriving in June before this came out and they prepaid for their stay. Are you going to refund that for them? Of course. You know <laughs> what though? I, I'm not, I, I just wonder if it really means the whole tax because to us, there's sales tax, there's the city tax, the state tax, and there's an occupancy tax. Right. They it's only tax. a dollar fifty a night. And okay. I was kind of shocked that 
somebody would actually post this. Ooh, you don't have to pay the occupancy tax. It uh, that maybe that's a mess, uh, unclear messaging, because if you say you don't have to pay the whole whatever it is, fifteen percent, now you're saving fifty percent. That's a message. Yeah, saving the occupancy tax to me says, oh, you got to you can buy an ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> if you stay for three nights, you'll save enough to buy an ice cream cone. I thought I remembered it being higher than that, but you, you would know better than I would on that. Um, the full tax with the city now, the tax, tax, the no, state not. tax, and the occupancy tax. And mm. It is $3.50 if you have a suite, a one-bedroom suite, and it's okay. $1.50 just the occupancy tax. Just the occupancy. So That's it could really be a failure problem. to communicate. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to try. Oh no, no audio. Dang it. Start writing signs. Yes. Yeah, write it in the chat. Oh, oh, okay. Here's my brilliant idea, by the way. Yeah. Five brilliant idea. Seven five percent hotel room occupancy tax. Occupancy. Tax. Sorry, say it again. It's five point eight seven five percent. So the section of the of the, the full tax is that that you're 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 getting part of the tax removed because there's still other tax. Okay. Okay. So here's something if you want to go search that I thought is a brilliant idea if somebody were to build it. Uh, a, uh, American Sign Language. Uh, local, what got me thinking about this and looking into this was a local uh, McDonald's, poo-poo on them, uh, did not provide service to a hearing impaired person because they didn't want to be bothered with it is the way it went. They didn't because they hearing impaired, their, their kiosks were down and the person behind the counter, and this was recorded on video or something, told them, I can't deal with you because you can't talk to me or something rude and totally insensitive and total dinkhead. Uh, and so it made news. And then that brought up the fact that somebody that teaches driver's education to deaf people, because people have to go through education to do it, brought up about that this is pretty much a common thing, that this happens all the time, restaurants especially, that uh, people with... Did I try it again, Tammy. Can you hear me now? Yay! Yay. <laughs> so, so it turned out that that we miss a lot of the need, especially these travelers on certain levels. And one of them is the ability to communicate on all things. And so I looked up, is there an animated uh, Americans? Because first off, every country has their own sign language. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, American sign language is only recognized as an official language in the sixties. Didn't know that, but I also found out that there's also like five flavors of American sign language, depending upon the level of complexity yeah. that they represent. Didn't know like that either. <laughs> so, but the simplistic ALS, uh, ALS, American Sign Language, ASL, um, there, there is no automated visualization of this. And I thought it very interesting because we rely upon subtext. And if anybody's done closed captioning or subtext, you know, the inaccuracy factor of that is pretty high. It's like, but a lot of the stuff that you would think would be translatable to subtext and so forth doesn't really work well. Why doesn't somebody have an app that can listen to the audio and make it into that it's because an animation. Yes. Great yeah. idea. It's like, why don't somebody do that? I mean, there is one place in Europe that has built a animation person that does American sign language, or, uh, uh, I guess the sign language of the, whatever they're doing with not American sign language, but it's a basic sign language that translates text. So you type text and then it does the, uh, the, the, the sign language version of that. But to me, that's very like, you know, like when you're talking another language, you don't know the language. Hi. Me, Lauren, you know, it's like, you know, it's very simplistic, like, okay, sure, you know, strange person. I think that should be a more advanced way of doing it, but nobody's built something like that. There's one in Japan that's for Japanese, and because of the intonations associated with uh, Japanese language, that sign language doesn't translate well, they did this animation thing that does that kind of same stuff. But nobody's built something that's like, hey, look, if I talk at it, I can then do the, the or, or, you know, it can listen to somebody talking and it'll do that because... For everybody that I know that's hearing a challenge, you know, with this, lip reading is a thing. And man, you get me involved, I'd be like, yeah, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm, I'm always impressed with people that can read lips. But that's a hard, why make people go through that when you can help them with a, something that can translate it? So anyway, that was my brilliant idea of the day. 
It like, is a brilliant <laughs> idea. I hope somebody does it. Uh, you know, also, I really want to say when I watch the news sometimes and a public official is making a speech and there's somebody like wildly yeah. gesturing behind them, they steal the show completely. <laughs> I am so fascinated by looking what? at that person that I can barely pay attention to what the guy is saying or lady. And, and I uh, have heard people say, why don't we why don't we just have the captions because people are going to watch it on television and they have captions underneath if they if they are not hearing well and and only have that person for the actual audience because it is a distraction from the message that the politician is giving but one of the things that you see in that person doing the sign language that I, I like to watch is watching their facial expressions. Exactly. And, and just some of their general expressions, right? So your your closed captioning doesn't give you the expression, right? Yeah. And and I don't know American Sign Language, but I suspect that those facial impressions and things like that are kind of a key part of the translation process. Yeah, it is true. Yeah. Tim, you want to say something before you lost your audio? We went off on a whole different track. What, what I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I love the influence of the show. It's like we had solutions to the universe, but you know what? I forgot. It's okay. <laughs> I, I do have something to add about New York, though. Okay. Because just opened is the Little Island NYC, which is in the um, uh, Hudson Hudson River Park area. So it's going to be so amazing for the people who live on the uh, Lower West Side or, or, you know, I think Chelsea downward. But, uh, you know, Barry, D Barry Diller, the uh, chairman of Expedia, had been working on this now for a full 10 years, a public and private uh, venture together, which is, of course, the result of so many wonderful things happening in New York, like Bryant Park, Hudson Yard, so many things. And uh, it was just beautiful this morning to see all the people out and about without masks, enjoying life. And it's just this, it's like a one of the piers on the west side it's like a bridge or a pier that goes out to this man-made wonderland of uh, it's it's so lovely. It has a slight Disney World uh, quality to it, or it's a, like you visited Singapore if you've ever been to Singapore, and they have they have just one lovely area after another. It reminded me of that. And it, it's such a beautiful thing that it, uh, tourists should definitely come to New York this summer uh, and this spring and see it. It is it, it's just beautiful, and I can't wait to see it myself. And then in the fall, we're going to have um, one Vanderbilt open, actually very close to the Library Hotel, and uh, and for one of those incredible glass elevators that go up the sky, uh, the skyscraper. It's going to be amazing. There are so many things to look forward to in New York. To tell you the truth, when we were talking about the marketing conference being in Texas, I used to live in Texas too, in, in Dallas and in Houston. So I'm looking forward to going and I think it's smart to pair with the um, high tech and, and uh, rock uh, conferences, but it kind of breaks my heart a little not to have it in Manhattan. I was I a little that, skeptical yeah. of being in Manhattan in January, though. I was waiting for the one time that it was a blizzard up there, and uh, it was a blizzard up there one time. I was going to say really yeah. well. <laughs> it was the time I first brought Renee up to go. Hey, I got to speak in New York. Come on with me. And it was like she froze it or took us off. It was like we were we were looking. You know, when you walk down New York and you're looking for a heater to heater. <laughs> <laughs> I only had to cross the street to go to that conference. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Sure. That was that. But now you're not there anymore. So I do want to bring up something that Robert brought up last week in his list. We didn't get this list this week on time to talk about some of whatever he brings What's up out? last week. Huh? It did out. go out? Yeah. Yay. So one thing he brought up last week was the uh, earnings results of the um, brands. And and I and I wanted to add it to a dialogue about brand and brand reemergence and uh, something I did on the podcast, but I wanted to bring it up here and see what you guys' thoughts were. Is 
So Mar- Marriott, as an example, is coming back into business with the 31 flavors of brand. Okay. Hey, we're back, you know, and they furloughed everybody in the universe and now they're trying to rebuild their infrastructure. And right now from anybody that's handling brand properties, the, the brands are just throwing out freebies like, oh, we'll match your funds on Meta or we'll match your funds on travel ads or, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll amp up based on demand, historical demand, uh, your market as to advertisement in general, PPC, you can help fund that as well. They're just throwing out gimmies. Um, they're not really, I know from their marketing strategy, there's no real marketing strategy. It's just funding basic fat fruit branding into the market. They're coming back with these brands. They're trying to identify these different brands. Hyatt's creating a new brand, which we let me made fun of as the TikTok brand because of the logo look. Um, how is this going to work for the brands in market? You have like Sonata, uh, Sonesta, sorry. Uh, that are aggregating a lot of really cool properties. You have a lot of mergers that happened quiet. Not wouldn't say quietly. We've, we've talked about them, but different mergers, uh, acquisitions come together. There's a different landscape to this. Do you see brands being the solution for recovery, or just the de facto they got benefit of the fact everybody's trying to go back to travel and they're staying at a brand? Is the brand really driving the business at this point? I mean, am I going to that Marriott because I'm going to get the Marriott points, or because it just <clears throat> happens to be in the location I want for the rate that I want? I mean, or Actually, there's no discount rates right now. It's just it's in the place that I want. What do you think? Are you asking from a consumer perspective or a hotelier perspective? I don't know. Pick one. I'm good. <laughs> and for me, as a traveler, I'm going to make my choice best based on what's best for me, based on location, price, and the amenities and the product that I'm looking for. And if you want to give me points, super. I'm signed up for everybody's loyalty program. Right. Well, I'm loyal to no one. I'm <laughs> only loyal to myself and my family. So uh, we're going to make a choice based on what we like. And, you know, I think people have heard me say it a, a hundred times by now. Uh, you transfer me over to the reservations office of of the brand. I am having such an unhappy experience <laughs> compared to what I actually have at the hotel. Well, well you're also including VRBO, Airbnb. They play, they come into different. Uh, it's it's about what you get available in the market you're interested in going in. Those now are ag- equitable considerations. But anyway, what else? What, what else? Dean, well, you asked the difference. Yeah, for, well, from a hotelier perspective, though, go, going to the brand, I go to the brand for the same reason I go to the OTAs, because it's easy, right? So I've got all this stuff that I need to do. They tell me I need to do marketing. They tell me I need to do all these things. And, you know, I've got a brand, brand, you do it for me. Brand, you do it. You do the marketing. You give me my tech, my uh, CRS, my distribution, just like I go to the OTAs. Right after every major crisis we've ever seen, hoteliers would sell their sales to the OTAs. They will do it again. They are doing it again. And it's just like, okay, yeah, yeah, hotels.com. Yeah, cool. Send me rooms, just like we were saying in the European market. It's easy. Now, does that make it right? Is that the best way to go? Not necessarily. But just like we were saying, I can give you a silver dollar for 50 cents. Um, you know what? No, no, no. I'm going to take the easy road. Well, so, yeah. okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Melissa. brings me to a slightly off tangent but related topic. I am wondering about where we are with deals thing so like travel zoo and groupon Mm. where we're at a point where if your property is in a destination that's open you're full you're understaffed and yet people are sending out deals (laughs) i don't understand yeah it's easy because it's easy i have something that demi you want to say something go ahead well, I, I'll actually t- chime in on Melissa's point. Um, yeah, because it's easy and we've always done it and I'm old school and so that's what I'm doing and I'm just not thinking through or I'm not partnering with my revenue management, my sales teams to fully understand and, and come up with a strategy. So yeah. you're, you're right. I mean, if I'm filling up rapidly and I'm understaffed as is and I'm like, why am I undercutting the business when I could be making more money on that? So yeah. Um, yeah. But the point I was making on Dean, you know, talking about the brands and it's easy. I think the other side of the coin too, and I'm not qualified enough to talk about this in any true sense of the form, but I'm hearing from a lot of owners that the banks are requiring them to have a brand affiliation for a loan, right? So, so it's not even just that it's easy. It's that, Hey, if I want the capital in order to, to, to buy a hotel, 
I got to have a brand behind it now. And I think that's where you're seeing a lot of the emergence of these soft brands, right? Because mm-hmm. I can have what I need for the bank requirement, but still have an element of that independent. I mean, it's an, let's be real, it's an element and, and it's, you know, not, I don't have the same level of control, but I think that's the other reason you're seeing a lot of, of stuff within the brands. Now, whether or not the brands are the, the path back from where we were to, you know, where we're to recovery and growth, I don't know. But I think that's why you're seeing a lot of, of uh, shift towards brands is because of that reason. You know, your associate Craig, I forget his last name. What's his last name? Craig Carbonier. Yeah. Yes. He put out something on LinkedIn the other day and said, what's your favorite brand? Mine's preferred hotels. And I like had to restrain myself. That's not a brand. That's a club. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's a soft brand, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah. They, they've branded themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So okay, keeping in mind for that, um, you, you bring up some good, some good points about the, 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 usability of brand and the value proposition for it. If, 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 did you see the recent Expedia ad that's rolling right now about that we're here for you? And it's their portrayal of how they are helping you in your travel journey. You're going to get the better room. You're going to get the better um, experience. You're going to find more of what you're interested in doing uh, from us. We're going to be providing more for you by doing the booking with us than you would be by just picking a place that you're staying and then having to do the rest for you, uh, for yourself. And I thought it was an interesting way of approaching this because then you look at the Airbnb ads. Hey, remember those times you had playing a board game where your pets were hanging around you and you all didn't care about the fact that, you know, you're not in the lobby of a hotel. You're not crammed up in a little bed, one bedroom room where y'all are sitting on the same bed. You're in a living space and it's a shared living space and it's, it's tailoring hard on those ads. Yeah. And and they're pushing the types of travel. I'd also say that uh, to what you mentioned earlier, Tammy, is that there's been a lot of acquisitions of properties that were taken up by investment companies, mergers, that uh, the bank was more interested in making sure somebody carried the note at a very reduced price than it was to let the, comp- the, the property itself go into a receivership profile where they then had to put money from the bank's perspective to maintain it operating that doesn't mold out or close out or whatever. They much rather somebody come in and they forego the fact that those people came in and said, we're ripping the flag off of this thing. It's not worth it for us to have a flag on this. So they were able to acquire the asset without the brand, the brand requirement of a financial relationship. Is that happening everywhere? No, it happened a lot in New York. I'll be honest with you. That's the one in my head. In New York, a lot of hotels that were super expensive, newly renovated, worth 150 million, you had some company came in and threw 25 million at and picked up the note and they cleared half the debt and they're running with a property that's worth 150 million that they only have a $75 million commitment to and 25 million was in front front cash. So they they picked it up on pennies on the dollar. Does that happen everywhere? But it's been happening in places. Um, That's why I bring up this now. Okay, so going to your idea, Melissa, about why are people putting discounts out there? And this is a discussion I had with Ed about something he was sharing data wise, the booking windows of people's interest in discovery, the the booking window that we refer to in revenue management is microscopically small right now. We're getting transition points measured in hours of view acquisition. We know those numbers. So my Siri went off. Um, But the discovery window is months ahead of that. We, we know there's been this germination process through COVID where people have been persistently looking at aspirational interests. Well, if I want to go to New York, what am I going to do? If I, when I finally get to New York, what am I going to do? Where am I going to pop? So there's just been this long tail research process that's going on. If that be the case, and, and it's still going forward, people are still looking forward because people still haven't decided when they're going to travel. So there is a large six month plus window of people's discovery. I've actually changed some of my marketing things and I'm getting traffic from it, which is very interesting. I just started this last week where I'm talking about December and next spring in um, uh, Dalte, right in Canada right now. That's in my market. I'm talking about things in there and I'm offering opportunities for book nows that I would probably not from a real rate yield point of view when we get into the book window of those same time periods be offering again. 
I'm offering the incentive of conversion now. I'm still leaving gateways of cancellations and so forth. I'm not trying to rope them in, but I'm offering things now about long-term things and I'm getting traction. So anyway, go ahead, Liddell, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Christopher Hutton, I think his name is, yeah. He, the revenue guy, he is such a smart guy. He was talking about how people are hoarding right now reservations because they're afraid that they won't be have any availability for the end of this year early next year and so they're booking way in advance and hoarding them and the cancellations have been crazy mm -hmm. and i i fear that we're in another one of those times when now i remember why we put in the prepaid non-refundable reservations right. at a discount. And basically it really, in a way it wasn't at a discount because you kind of marked up to have a premium for people who needed that quick cancellation and then and then had that other, I, I wonder how fast we see that coming in and how difficult it may or may not be to actually, uh, keep to those uh, when yeah. somebody cancels. So I'm seeing one, actual booking windows are certainly growing. We finally are seeing clients that are seeing 90 plus day bookings out, which is great. We haven't seen that in a while. So that is a growing trend for at least our clients. But I had a call yesterday with a client that blew my mind because they said that if people are calling to cancel, they are happy to take the cancellation, give them their full refund, and then go resell that room for three times the price that it was booked at. Oh. Because that's the demand right now. Oh, we've got that. That's yeah. many times we're living in. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's funny yeah. you mentioned that. I, so we're doing a California road trip next month, and I started planning and booking hotels a good two, three months ago. And we decided two weeks ago to skip one of the, the cities, just uh, like I'm shrinking the trip by a day, but in doing so I needed to add one night onto one of the hotels. And I went in to update the reservation. Those rooms aren't available, but your new rate, if you want to change this, was a hundred dollars more per night. And this is over what was a three and a four night stay. And I'm like, and I just said, Nope. And I actually booked a different hotel for the first night. I was like, I'm mm -hmm. like, we'll move. I don't care. This, it, it works out perfectly. Not a big deal, but nope. So yeah, yep. rates have gone up significantly just in the last couple months. It's I was watching funny. the Las sorry. Vegas market. Oh, sorry. I was watching no, the Las no, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The Las Vegas market in particular, and it's notorious in Las Vegas as you get into the summer, it's a hundred degrees out there that they have these really cheap rates, except on the weekends, and you are already starting to see that pattern. The same hotel that was literally $25 for a Tuesday night was selling for $300 on a Saturday. And just mm -hmm. insane. In the New York City, too, yeah. I was looking at uh, some hotels in New York City in September running $500 a night that normally, that I shouldn't say normally, that today would have been 125 Right. So, right. Yeah, they're going up all over the place. Well, 125 is not their normal rate. That's right. It was. Yeah. 365, 425, whatever. It's back it is. of the door rates. You know, that that's yeah. what I call them anyway. It's back of the door rates. The the maximum rack of allowable by law kind of thing. But it kind of brings back a, a haunting memory I had back in 08 when we had all this happen in 09. I made a website called uh, Hotel Promo Codes. And what I used it for was um, uh, not nefarious, but it was a way of, of, of reclaiming back some group blocks that were falling off. Back many of you shouldn't have a group meeting and spending too much money when financial crisis and all this stuff. So a lot of group things fell off, but I had all these group contracts. And so I took the group coding and leaked them on this platform of saying, hey, if you really want a really good rate at this hotel, this group rate will give you this rate. And I offered this to the groups that had uh, attrition clauses uh, that, hey, if you're okay with this, I'm going to put your rate on this platform. And if we can, you know, book people with this rate, you know, that'll reduce your attrition cost of what you did on bailing me on this group rate. And we started doing it. So then we started using it as a marketing tool. Where I was just making group rates, non-parody <laughs> things, just saying, uh, <laughs> where I offered them on the thing as a leaked rate. Uh, so people could get different rate I was offering for certain time time blocks and stuff like this. I'm thinking in a strange way, I might want to bring that back to life with what we're talking about because it's like if I have pre-blocks, as you said, hoarding, where people have, have gotten b b blocks that they booked and now they're looking to cancel them, I have a reseller window. 
I can go over and say, hey, okay, before you bail on this, if you want to, I'll go over and sell it here or just sell it off right, you know, saying, hey, I have this booking that's for three nights this way and this is the price that they got. If you want it, you can pick up the rate uh, and do it as a whole subculture to my rate strategy. I don't know. You don't even know what a box is. Your mind has no limits. <laughs> <laughs> it was just yeah, evil plans like that box. worked out well. <laughs> like, like, you tell me not. Hey, Lauren, I, first of all, thanks, guys. This has been so much fun today, but I have to go. I have another no, you're good. We're at the meeting that got work. thrown on yeah, my we're calendar. We're good. We're so. good. It's all good. Tim, hey, Tammy, before you go, people want to know what you do, where to find you, where to go. Uh, Tam Carla, head of hospitality at Milestone, Inc. You can find me at milestoneinternet.com uh, or I'm on LinkedIn as well. And um, just sneak preview. Uh, hopefully, I'll know dates in the next week. But we will be doing our Engage conference virtually again this year, probably Yay. in August. So I'll let you guys know once you're out there. But awesome uh, content, Thanks so much. Got to run. And, thanks, uh, Tim. Talk to you Appreciate guys soon. it always. Thanks for taking the time. Um, bye bye, Melissa. Before we because we might as well wrap things up. Unless there's some burning yearning idea that you wanted to throw out there. But if not, where is it they can find you and the award multi award winning podcast? You can find me on LinkedIn or on Clubhouse at Melissa Cavanaugh. Uh, all things related to podcasts and internet marketing, you can find at fueltravel.com. Awesome. Miss Adele, for people to find you and where? You can find me at adelegutman.com or email me at adele at adelegutman.com and visit the Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast where we talk about uh, real with real experts how to get great reviews how to create a culture of caring continuous improvement uh, and and just a very happy guests happy happy employees and happy bank accounts mr dean <laughs> you solve the world's universal problems with metasearch the unspoken unknown language of metasearch <laughs> <laughs> the mysteries of the voodoo that you do so well. <laughs> Where can they find you, your babe? <laughs> the babe yeah, with the right. Brain. Anyway, yes. So, uh, basecampmeta.com if you'd like to learn about MetaSearch, metasearchmarketing.com if you'd like somebody to do it for you. We can handle both ends of that. Uh, special announcement we're working with HSMAI. We put together an article that's going to be sent out as part of their executive insights letter. And we wanted to, to talk about meta search, right? But every time we talk about meta search, what does everybody talk about? Google. So there's a hundred articles out there talking about Google. So we said, you know what? We want to talk about everything else. So we've got a great article with HSMAI coming out next week to talk about the everything else beyond meta search, beyond Google. And we're going to be also using that to kind of kickstart and launch our MetaSearch educational series that we're doing with HSMEI, which has their certification, just like their uh, Certified Hospitality Digital Marketer, CHDM, did I say that right? CHDM, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, <laughs> get all the acronyms straight. Uh, so all of that launching with them next week as well. And uh, yeah, that. and you can reach me on LinkedIn or dean at basecampmeta.com. Speaking of HSMAI, I threw you all under the bus and saying to Ingen, who runs the HSMAI EU, and Jackie, who runs HSMAI APAC, hey, I know some people that would love to be speakers for you, just so you know. I just told me. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Seven in the morning is no big deal. No, no big it. deal. I would wake up early for HSMAI. Oh, that's interesting. Dean, you feel a little off on that. Maybe 5 a.m. is, eh, you know, it's a little coffee. Um, Okay, here's the long repertoire for this show and all previous 301. You can go to hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. There you'll see that in all the show notes. It has also been simulcast dun, 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 on our new hospitality channel dot TV, which we'll be replaying and you can watch it on there as well. And also you can find us on Roku, Apple Plus, uh, Apple TV, uh, Google Play and Amazon Prime as well. Uh, with that also is our podcast, My Hospitality Marketing, which you can find at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash podcast. You can also find Adele's wonderful podcast, uh, where I share that link. And also, I, I also sneak in uh, Fuel Travels just because I like riding on your coattails, Melissa. Sorry. <laughs> I throw on your... <laughs> I, I throw a link. And by the way, if you want to set the podcast, it's right here. You know, um, And also Dean's and also... Um, uh, Miss Lily Mockerman's, her revenue management podcast, which is truly outstanding as well. Uh, Holly hasn't given us a new one recently, but uh, she says she will be rolling one around somewhere. But we do have a sales parking podcast that is always great content. It's evergreen in that sense. Um, and we also do our Clubhouse Monday through Thursdays at noon. Should you have that app? If not, if you need an invitation, let me know. I'll be happy to send it because 
they seem to be a little easier to come by these days. So I have a number of them, but that is at noon on Clubhouse where we do pretty much open dialogue, uh, similar to what we had today. So we hope that you can join us there as well and participate with us at always. So now that I've hit every channel in the universe, I do know why aliens haven't come and visit us. Because if, if they can't, if hoteliers can't take what we're giving them as good advice and just not do anything with it, why are aliens going to come down and solve world peace if we're just going to know what to do with it? So I think I've solved the reason why there's no aliens coming visiting us, or at least letting us know that they visit us. Just saying. Um, okay. With that, thank you all for the privilege of your time. Sincerely, uh, it thank is always so a pleasure much. and a joy. I, I come in every, every time I come into this, it's like, okay, I wonder if I'm going to do this by myself, and then never ever this <laughs> the fact that I enjoy the conversation always. So thank you very very much. Um, till next Friday or till next Monday or whenever we have to cross paths again. We'll see everybody next on uh, this show next Friday, 11:30 a.m. Eastern. So thank have you everybody. Good. Good. Uh, have a good weekend. Bye everyone. Great weekend. <laughs>